And Titanfall's recent surge in popularity can quite hilariously be attributed to them bringing private matches out of beta by removing the beta text and nothing else. Are pilots godly masters of the battlefield, capable of wiping out entire platoons on their own without breaking a sweat? Or just pretty good soldiers? Your answer to this question likely shows how much of Titanfall or Apex's lore that you've been exposed to. In Titanfall, pilots were said to be real, extremely skilled and disciplined soldiers who have successfully run the gauntlet in under one minute. They are not super soldiers. Now, a super soldier is a bit of a confusing definition, but I'm pretty sure that this statement is objectively wrong. The concept of the super soldier is typically someone who is better than other soldiers through either cybernetic or genetic enhancements, and yeah, pilots are exactly that. Stim and phase shift pilots are literally robotic people, and the AWOL and cloak guys get a tertiary arm, the hollow pilot uses... I mean, well, look at this. Not to mention that all pilots have a super high-tech neural link with their Titan, which is a literal robot human body. That sure as hell sounds a lot like cybernetic enhancement to me. But Titanfall does a lot to legitimize pilots by reinforcing that most of their combat power does not come from sci-fi magic, but extreme discipline, extensive training, and in human skill. Compare this to, say, Halo Spartans, who are extensively genetically modified and trained from birth to be extremely effective combat assets. While only a handful can become proper Spartans, and their fate is usually decided from birth, a pilot can theoretically be anyone who is willing to put in the hours to try to overcome the kind of ridiculous 98% failure rate. Where the most powerful Spartan was trained from birth, the most effective pilot in all of Titanfall was just some random dude in the right place at the right time. This makes trying to gauge the actual average combat effectiveness of a pilot extremely confusing and kind of inconsistent. If the most powerful pilot of all time was literally a random rifleman trained by a pilot in their off time, what does that say about the other few thousand pilots out there? Now, uh, practically every story about conflict and strife, which realistically is just about every story, needs someone on the bottom of the power scaling totem pole. If you want to establish a character that is powerful in some way, such as in wits, strength, or knowledge, they have to be better at it than someone else. And Titanfall is no different, and the totem pole looks like this, with the grunts at the bottom, specters and other mechanized infantry just above, with pilots above them and titans at the top. Grunts are the bottom of the barrel unit. They are almost comedically easy cannon fodder for a pilot, and you will die to a grunt maybe once in a hundred matches, and always by sheer chance. That makes pilots kind of a big deal, to the point where it's almost confusing why grunts are even deployed to these engagements when their success rate against even a single pilot is less than a percent of a percent. Then, uh, many, many years later, Apex's animation department cranked out Gridiron. Anita and Jackson, the main characters in the short, are just grunts from Titanfall at this point, and they will become the Legends Bangalore and Newcastle in the future. They come across a pilot who, by all rights, should just do this, but instead the two Legends somehow manage to kill the guy. If we give these two the benefit of the doubt, and assume they were always as good as they are in Apex, that means that we can place a Legend's proper power at roughly 0.7% of a pilot. That is a lot higher than what was assumed up until this point. Due to the hilariously low pilot certification rate, most Titanfall fans, myself included, assumed that if a pilot like Blisk entered the arena, they would smoke every other contestant single-handedly, even without a team behind them. If we don't give these two the benefit of the doubt, that means that two grunts are able to kill a pilot, which is absolutely ridiculous given what we see in Titanfall. This one cinematic may seem kind of innocuous. Bangalore and Newcastle kill the pilot in the past, whatever. But the implication of this one animation sunk pilots from incredible war heroes to grunts on walls. In the cinematic, they wanted to establish Anita and Jackson as at least on par with a pilot. However, both of them were literally at the bottom of the totem pole before this encounter. Them jumping from the bottom to as high as they can feasibly go in power level from one encounter destabilizes and delegitimizes everything around it. Now, I do think it is a reasonable response to counter this by saying it's just one encounter, it can't really affect that much, 
But this was not the case of Anita getting lucky, and she isn't in possession of some magical powers or extreme training. This was an extremely protracted and long fight between three people who have no reason or intent to toy with each other. Scryer, a man who is literally listed as Commander, not winning instantly against two people so far below his station, reflects horribly on every other pilot in the universe. This is like if Blisk got bullied by two privates, it delegitimizes not only him but also makes people question the untouchable touchable nature of other leaders, too. The best way I can think to articulate the difference between how pilots were perceived versus how they were portrayed is with a fan comic right from when Apex first released. The comic depicts Bloodhound, Gibraltar, and Bangalore herself walking through an old IMC facility, before a pilot bends a Kraber around using an arc star to instantly KO Bloodhound, before saying, <laughs> Intruder alert. I don't care if you boys and girls enjoy Blisk's new paintball game. The ring. I think Bangalore's face and reaction here tells miles more than the official cinematic ever did. This one animation heavily undermines the themes of both Titanfall games and even Apex. Bangalore as a character is an ex-IMC grunt, and is meant to serve to show what normal people in the IMC were like, to reinforce the morally grey nature of the war that was shown in Titanfall 1. The IMC in the Gridiron cinematic is just like a mustache-twirling cartoon villain for some reason, who decides, of course, to open fire on an entire village of civilians for fun. And so it does his best to throw away not only the themes of Titanfall, but literally the theme of the character that he is fighting. <laughs> Jackson and the entire village decide to forgive Bangalore for absolutely no well-explained reason. You did what you thought was right, so it's okay that you called a war criminal to us and almost certainly a follow-up IMC cleanup crew because we killed the pilot, sis. It's understandable why this animation was made with the choices that they went with, because Titanfall's inherent consistency is sort of mixed. The depictions of pilots, titans, and everything else in multiplayer is very different from their single-player counterparts. Grunts are useless everywhere, but pilots and titans seem to be a lot more valuable in single player than they are in multiplayer. I have no idea if this was an intentional design choice or if it's the result of gameplay simply being king. Is Jack Cooper canonically meant to be a super badass that wipes the floor with every single pilot that he comes across effortlessly? Or is that just how the gameplay mechanics make it look? I've got no clue. That problem is not unique to Titanfall. Power scaling inconsistencies are in just about every franchise, and Halo's Master Chief is a great example. He's basically an anime character in the books, but in gameplay is literally identical to an ODST. The most classic example of inconsistent power scaling, however, is Star Wars Stormtroopers. Isn't it funny how Stormtroopers can't hit anything? What a funny, wacky joke, Dave Filoni! Believe it or not, the Imperial Stormtrooper used to be quite the prestigious position. Now, they canonically get mocked for having shitty aim, but in literally the first scene of the entire franchise, they annihilate a rebel ambush with almost no casualties while coming through the worst choke point of all time. Today, this is justified because these are actually 501st clones in Stormtrooper armor, but the consistency of a clone trooper's power is entirely dictated by whether the writers want them to win or not. Are they all as deadly as Jango Fett, Mandalorian bounty hunter with several Jedi kills under his belt, or dumb enough to run at a droid and punch it? Yeah. This problem is caused by what I said near the beginning of this video. If you want to establish a character as powerful in some way, they have to be better at it than someone else. This kind of issue can be commonly attributed to handing franchises between writers. Karen Travis kind of understood that if you make clones based off the most prolific bounty hunter of all time and then train them from birth, they are going to be the most ruthless, emotionally stunted, efficient murderers you could possibly train. Other writers did not really grasp that and needed some people to die in the background. There are hints that Lucas's original vision for Stormtroopers was a genuinely kind of terrifying force rather than a paper tiger. Obi-Wan reinforces that they're scary, they're literally named after the SS, and it takes space magic to get away from them. Obi-Wan and Kenobi, on the other hand, would have just stabbed a motherfucker. After going on half a century, stormtroopers have been smartphoned by so many people that they're basically a joke. Back in Empire, they were shown extremely competently sieging, sacking, and dismantling a rebel fortress, not to mention later in the film where they occupy an entire goddamn planet in the span of a few minutes. Even just a movie later, they were back to getting wiped by Vietnamese teddy bears, and now they can't shoot a can ten feet away. You can use the excuse that these are the men of Vader's fist to explain why they're actually competent when no one else is, but I will counter with the fact that there is absolutely nothing differentiating these men. You know, like the sick-as-fuck blue marks of the 501st. Not to mention, uh, where were these men during Endor? <laughs> Saying these are the 501st is just an after-the-fact excuse to explain away extremely inconsistent writing. 
With pilots, do you really think every person who has ever worked on Apex not only is aware of the ridiculous 2% certification rate of pilots, but actually pondered deeply about the implications of it? No, obviously not. The basic concept is extremely simple to grasp, and it's not hard to see how the idea for Bangalore's animation made it into the writer's room. So these guys are cooler than these guys, but hey, hear me out. What if these guys one anyway. <laughs> this kind of problem is extremely common in media that has been going on for a long time, and it's incredibly difficult to handle in video games. The Payday Gang went from having regenerating armor to basically being super villains, and are now back to a relatively sane state with no narrative justification for any of these changes. No one ever acknowledged why they're capable of healing all their wounds by killing someone with a katana, nor is their recent faceplant power being acknowledged at all. They are just gameplay changes, and it makes what's actually happening in the narrative an absolute nightmare to try to follow, especially when there are actual genuine supernatural elements in play. Another fantastic example of this type of cognitive dissonance is brought to us by Kojima. He is absolutely legendary for making characters that are absolute demons in cutscenes and then punching bags in gameplay. Which one is their true power level? I have no idea. As a brief aside, this video is going to be serving as the beginning of a fresh series as well. I wanted some way to distinguish the projects I've made that center around writing rather than game design, and this funny title scheme seemed like a good way to do it. Additionally, the, the funny name I came up with is also really pretentious and I really like it. As well as that, these videos from before are getting retroactively added to this series as they have very similar formats and talk about similar issues. And to conclude, give me your genuine answer to this in the comments, I'm, I'm actually quite curious as to hear what people say. Are pilots godly monsters on the battlefield? or just pretty good soldiers? Is the way Cooper depicted in gameplay meant to be canon? Single player campaigns do tend to have more of a claim to legitimacy than multiplayer does, right? I'm afraid there isn't going to be an objective answer. It is a matter of opinion, whether you like it or not, and I don't like it very much. Unrelated, but uh, uh Titanfall 3-1? Thanks to Emmy for their reckless financial abandon. Both them and the rest of my patrons are all wonderful people. Like, comment, subscribe, all that, you, you know the drill. And join my Discord. I love you all, and good night.